Hi, welcome to the Retro Shed. I'm Barry and this is... Josh. Josh. He's saying his name in a different way now, aren't you? Hello. You're coming of age, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Yes. Anyway, we've looked at games and consoles and computers before in this shed, which is pretty much what we do. But we've not really dwelled on a particular developer before, have we? Mm -hmm. We, now, we looked at Atari that once. We looked at Atari, we looked at Rare, we've looked at a few people. Yeah. Now, over the 80s and 90s, some brilliant coding houses existed that brought us some awesome games such as Rare, uh, Codemasters, Psygnosis? LucasArts. LucasArts, yeah, good one. I could go on, but there is one British coding house that were the equivalent of rock stars, and these were founded in the late 80s that deserves very, very special attention, and that's what we're going to do today. And that bunch of talented individuals is, of course, the yeah. wonderful for the bitmap brothers now same thing now right we have covered some of their games before when we looked at the amiga quite a long time ago mm. and we've taken a look at their first game in an early video as well which was of course xenon oh. but the bitmaps played such a huge part in the british video game scene that we really need to take a closer look at them we do actually so josh You've known a little bit about the Bitmap Brothers, haven't you, um, lately? Give me an amazing fact about the Bitmap Brothers. Well, they weren't actually brothers. No, they weren't actually brothers. That is a good point. Can you give me perhaps another another one? Um, how about their original game, Xenon? Oh. You know Xenon, right? Do I know Xenon? It's one of my favourite games of all time, yeah. Yeah, just checking. Mm. Well, it wasn't always called Xenon. It was originally called Kelly X after its creator, Steve Kelly. I do believe you're right on that one. Well done. Yeah, their visual style is instantly recognisable. And did you know that they drew their graphics in such a way with CRT monitors in mind? Mm. They actually tailored some of their pixels, some of their sprites to take advantage of phosphor afterglow on CRT monitors. Now that's clever. Right, yes. Um, I have no idea what you just said. Okay, but as always on this channel, we don't just look at their games. We want to know where did the story of the bitmap brothers begin. Absolutely. So, and after doing some digging, I found out that the origins of the bitmap brothers can be traced to Woolworths, giving up smoking, and a Sinclair ZX Spectrum 81. Nice to <laughs> Nicely put, actually, that's right. The Bitmap Brothers story begins with uh, a Woolworths retail manager called Mike Montgomery. Now, Mike was pretty bored with his job at this point as a retail manager, <laughs> but after using a computer at work, it fired his imagination and he decided he wanted to know more about computers. Mm -hmm. Now, Mike had his eyes on a newly released ZX81, oh, and nice which machine. was released in March 1981. Yeah. So he decided to pack in smoking and bought himself one plus a 16k ram pack that which would have cost a, probably about 80 90 pounds back in the day so yeah it was good of him to stop smoking now this started mike down the road of coding and with some help from popular computing weekly which was a magazine back then he started how to he started to learn how to code z80 machine code now eventually this landed him a job at leisure genius even though his wages were about a third of what he was getting at Woolworths, he joined leisure but he enjoyed genius it more, I'm he probably did yeah, yeah. shortly after after this time, Mike was introduced to a shiny new computer that was doing the rounds, the C64. Oh, nice machine. Which had a totally different processor mm. to what he was used to coding with. Absolutely. <laughs> now, the Commodore had the MOS 6510. Yes, it did. Where the ZX81 had the Z80 processor. Yes. So he had to learn how to code again. He literally had to learn, machine. yeah, he had to learn a new language, literally. Over the next few years, Mike started writing games on the Apple II, which were then cross-compiled onto the Commodore 64 Cross and the Spectrum. And eventually, Leser Genius secured the rights to a new game called Scale X Trick. What, as in like the, um, as in like the Scale X Trick yeah, tracks? Yeah, I've never seen the game. We'll have to take a look at it, actually. Oh. And Steve Kelly was brought on board at this point to help develop the game. Steve Kelly had previously created the brilliant Spectra Racer game, Check and Flag, which we actually... We do have doing. it, yeah. We did, we and I didn't know that was Steve Kelly, as in for, Steve Kelly. Yeah, for Poseidon in yeah. 1983, which we took a look at as well, which I said. Steve was a brilliant Spectrum coder and was working for as for Leisure Genius. He was, yeah. Now, one more brother who wasn't a brother, brother joined the team at this point, and that was graphics specialist and sculpture student, a chap called Eric Matthews. Now we have three very different talents spending their time talking about games and playing arcade games down the pub, which sounds like a very good pass time to me. Yes, soon Leisure Genius was swallowed up in a merger with Rabbit Software, great name. great name, and a new company was formed with money from Richard Branson, and this 
this was called Virgin Interactive. Yeah, it was, yeah. Which I've never heard of. <laughs> and around this time, the three of them were dabbling with an idea for a game called Kelly X. Kelly X, yeah. Now, Mike left Virgin Interactive. Which I've never heard of. Kelly X. Xenon. No, Virgin Interactive. Oh, okay. I'll show you some Virgin Interactive games. Actually. Mike left Virgin Interactive in 1987 with Kelly and Matthews working on a game called ST Karate. Mike joined them soon after work on the Amiga port of this game, and the three of them were soon working together. Is that when they call themselves the brothers? Not yet. <laughs> Kelly and Matthews had finished Kelly X at this point, and the game caught the attention of publisher Mastertronic. And as the game featured not only very cool visuals, a ship that could morph between being an aircraft or a tank. That's good. It also featured Eric Matthews in the sunglasses and a short hairdo announcing the start of each sector at the beginning of each level. So, sector, sector one. one. Is that's that how right. he actually sounded? Yeah, that's exactly how it sounded, actually. Now, this game blew me away when I first saw it running on the Atari ST. It was just incredible. Anyway, before the game could be released, the three of them needed a company. And this was the birth of the Bitmap. That's Brothers. what they call Brothers. Yeah, pretty much. Where did you get Bitmap from? That's Bit the way they. Like yeah, it's the way they draw. But they soon decided it was an awesome name and it was also based on the style of artwork they yeah. produced and the cooperation between the three chaps. They were a close trio. Mm. So the distinctive hand logo was created by Eric Matthews soon after and the Bitmap Brothers were born. Now, Xenon was released in January 1988, which was over 2, 10, 12... Uh, 30 odd years 30, ago? 30, exactly, 30 years yeah. ago. And was extremely well received by critics everywhere. Computer and video games magazines raved about it in their March 1988 edition. I did have that copy and somewhere. Eugene Lacey said in the five years of reviewing games, this is the best shooter I've ever played. Mm. It's difficult for me to tell you how good Xenon is. This is arcade entertainment to play at home and no bull. It was awarded Game of the Month. It was awarded Game of the Month, actually. Xenon was launched not only on the ST and Amiga, but also as an arcade coin-op. Although, to this day, I've never, ever seen Xenon in an arcade anywhere, ever. Well, no, because we don't have any arcade no, no, but even back then, oh. I just couldn't see it anywhere. The first time I ever played Xenon was on a friend's Atari ST, and it was probably one of the most amazing games I had ever played. There was nothing new about it, there was nothing unique about it as a virtual no. scrolling shooter. There was plenty of those around, but it was the way it was presented, the way it was drawn, the way it was done, and it's very, very difficult, actually. Not as difficult as Ghosts and Goblins! That's not a good start on that. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering why the name was changed, while well, it was because of piracy. Mm. A pre-production copy was leaked by a journalist. I'm never going to cover journalists. <laughs> and they knew exactly who did it because co each copy released was fingerprinted. Yeah, yeah. But that's history for That's you. amazing, isn't it? They and know. before the days of the internet. Yeah, piracy before the days of the internet. And they actually know which journalist released the copy of, of Kelly X Xenon. That must have really annoyed them, ever so slightly. Let me guess, but, he was sent to prison. Mm, I think they kept quiet about it, to be honest with you. After the success of Xenon, Mastertronic decided they wanted a tennis game, and they changed their mind, though, shortly afterwards, and decided that they wanted nothing else to do with the bitmaps. <laughs> <laughs> and of course the Bitmap Brothers then do what most gamers tend to do, they headed for the pub. And it wasn't long before they had the makings of another game and in true classic style wrote down their ideas on the back of a packet of cigarettes. Hang on, I thought you said he gave up smoking in 1981. Perhaps they weren't Mike Montgomery cigarettes anyway, or perhaps he decided to take up smoking again due to the stress of making video games, who knows. Mm could happen. So, from the ashes of the tennis game came a futuristic sports game featuring warp gates, characters who could attack each other in a gladiator style pit, and owed a few nods of the hat to the 1975 movie Rollerball, and that game was of course... Speedball! Absolutely brilliant. At this point, the bitmaps had a game, but they didn't have a publisher as Mastertronic had ditched them. Why? Why would you ditch the Bitmap Brothers? Anyway, after some failed negotiations with Houston Consultants and Telecomsoft, they ended up sealing a deal with Imageworks, which was a label under Robert Maxwell's Mirrorsoft company. I'm going to say Microsoft today. Honestly, I'm going to Microsoft. I'm going to accidentally say Microsoft. So if I do, Microsoft. It, please don't. Speak. Microsoft have caused me a lot of pain this week, but let's not even go there. Let's moving not, yeah, on. True. Things are moving fast for the Bitmaps. They moved into a new office in the Whopping Docklands of London. Mm. Bought some cheap furniture of some gypsies and also hired another bitmap brother called Mark Coleman who was a trained graphic designer to help complete Speedball. That's right, yeah. Now Speedball was released in November 1988 and went on to Same rave year reviews. Was... Same year as Xenon. Xenon was about a year before. 
So this was their second game. ST Action said it was the best two-player game they'd ever played on a home computer and it scored over 90% in The One magazine. It was even played to death by people who didn't even like sports games, like me. I can't stand sports games, really. The Bitmap Brothers brand and identity at this point was well and truly sealed and they were literally the equivalent of coding rock stars. <laughs> they were developer rock stars. They looked the part as well. They did. I mean, at one point they were visiting the Mirror Group um, building mm. and Robert Maxwell kept his helicopter on the roof. <laughs> so one well, where else would you keep a helicopter? <laughs> So one of the Mirosoft marketing team took advantage of this fact and arranged a photo shoot on the roof for the bitmaps with their helicopter. <laughs> with a helicopter. Decked out in sunglasses and standing in front of a helicopter. Now that was a pretty smart move actually because they ended up looking more like an 80s pop group like, I don't know, Depeche Mode yeah. than game coders. No longer nerds in bedrooms, these guys were the coolest development studio in the world. If yeah. you're literally holding a Bitmap Brothers game in your hands, you knew that it was going to be a quality piece of software. In 1988, British hip hop artist musician Tim Suminon That'll do. from the group Bomb the Bass released a track that went on to become the theme to the Beat My Brothers' next Smash game. That game was called Mega Blast, <laughs> and the game was the extremely successful follow up to their first game, Xenon. Mm. Called, not surprisingly, Xenon 2. Mega, Mega Blast, Blast. yeah. <laughs> now, inspiration for Xenon 2 came from wandering around arcades in London. What a great job! What a brilliant job! Imagine it, just wandering around our thing. And the team were pretty fond of Iron's smash shoot 'em up at the time, which was called R Type, and which it's one of the best shooters of all time, one of the hardest shooters which of I all hate. time. I love it. I just However, it time. due to the limitations of the Atari ST's hardware, which favoured vertical scrolling, Xenon 2 became another vertical scrolling scrolling shoot 'em up, like the original game. They wanted Xenon 2 to be a horizontal shooter, but the Atari ST couldn't hack it. So, like its original game, right. it was a vertical shooter. Yeah. So, Xenon 2 had a very organic look and feel to it, again drawing inspiration from R-Type, with its very organic, alien-type graphics. Yeah. So, level 1 of Xenon 2 had an undersea style, with seaweed and tentacles, with enemies that looked more like bacteria and other odd life forms. That was my idea, my that was my tentacle thing, do not matter. It's Carry on. The second level was land-based and featured insects and spiders. And the final level was only three levels. I think so, yeah. I've never got that far, it's too hard. Had a very technical <laughs> robotic feel to it. That's right. And the power-up system actually in this game was also enhanced from the first version and involved a collection of bubbles that were collected after shooting waves of enemies. Now, these bubbles are worth credits that could be used in Colin's Bargain Basement, which is a weapon shop that was owned and ran by an alien that looks somewhat like a predator and spent his time with his earphones on listening to bomb the bass. Did you know the alien was originally called Crispin? And this was no, the I didn't. only <laughs> and it was this and it was only changed to Colin in the Amiga C D thirty two. I didn't know that, I thought he was always called Colin. Interesting. No. Now, there is a weapon that can be bought in the shop called Super Nashwan Power. Oh yes. That gives you all the weapons for a limited limited few seconds. Yeah. Can I just say when we did our video on that, you said, Josh, buy that, so I clicked buy. I think you get 30 seconds, don't you, Super You've got like power. five. Oh, is it? And <laughs> do you know what? We started before even the enemies had spawned, so we practically wasted it. <laughs> <laughs> what is the point in starting with it when no enemies have spawned yet? I don't know. Okay, so... Now, if you look at the icon for it, it looks like a horse's head. It does. Now, this is because during 1988 to 1989, there was a very successful racehorse that was liked by Eric Matthews called <laughs> Nashwan. <laughs> and legend had it, this is why it's called Super Nashwan Power. I suppose that's why the icon looks like a horse's head. How interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, Xenon 2 was released in August 1989 on the ST and the Amiga, and needless to say, it was another instant hit for the Bitmap Brothers. Although loved by most people, some thought it was too slow, including a, including a Mirasoft executive. But most people loved it, to be fair. Yeah. Now, I have to admit here, I do prefer the original game, it's Xenon. So There's something about the first game that I just love, and I feel that it was a better game. I know a lot of people disagree with me, but I prefer Xenon. Mm. It also sounded absolutely brilliant on the Amiga. You only have to listen to the music on Xenon 2 whilst you're playing the game, and it's just another game to chug at ST owners and say, oh, the Amiga was better. So, what came next? 
I'll tell you what came next. As well as a brilliant comic book style artist by the name of Dan Malone, who joined the Bitmap Brothers, he left Palace Software and joined them. The next game is one that probably today is one of the finest games ever to be released on any computer or console. Now this game is probably responsible for breaking as many joysticks as Daily Thompson's Decathlon did on Kempston interfaces back in the early 80s. And that was the follow up to Speedball, aptly named Speedball 2 Brutal Deluxe. Brutal indeed. It is. Spec, <laughs> joysticks it yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> the spec for Speedball 2 is pretty simple. Bigger play area, at least double the size of the original pitch. Yeah. And the pitch for Speedball just scored down. Oh, it did score down, yeah. yeah. But for the sequel, they wanted the pitch so large that it needed to scroll in any direction. Up, down, left, right. Yeah, down, it was a, down, it was down, a multi screen down. pitch, wasn't it? So yes. they had to scroll all over the place. Now, for the first few weeks of the Speedball 2 project, Dan Malone was the only person working on it, and he was churning out pictures and art. And soon he was joined by expert coder Robert Trevelyan, who had been working on, strangely enough, an eight way scrolling demo, which of course suited the style of Speedball 2 perfectly. Now, Malone was actually at this point plotting pixels with my favourite joystick in the world. I think he wasn't using a mouse, he was using a joystick. And my favourite joystick in the world is, of course, the brilliant TAC-2 by Suncom. So mm -hmm. Mr. Dan Malone has got a very good choice. He's got good, good taste in joystick. Now, as the Amiga was the more capable machine than the ST, the game was pretty much designed you can't say that. and drawn on the Amiga <laughs> and then ported over to the ST. And this is why the Amiga was more frames of animation in the certain aspects of the game, such as the ball launch. Yeah, that's right, yeah. There is better lighting and different colour palette on the Amiga than the ST as well. Sorry. You can't say that. That's really going to upset some people, that is. Now the major storyline for the game is that speedball as a sport has fallen foul of corruption and the sport has been exiled to the underground and this is where your team Brutal Deluxe comes into play as a bunch of fresh faced rookies and they're not very good to be fair to start off with and you can tend to your team yeah, yeah, yeah. I was playing and the goalie ball's coming in it goes this way so he jumps out way yeah exactly what are you doing? they just tend to do their own thing don't runs they out of but you can tend to these strengths Good, and weaknesses. If you can't, then just through the management screen, and you can tweak the team's attributes and behaviour. Hang on, that sounds a bit EA to me. Paying to upgrade a team, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it's a good point, but you're not paying as such to win games. You you earn the money in the game to spend on your team, so you're not paying with a credit card or something. And I've got no problem with that. You're not paying to win, you're playing to win. And that's a huge difference, I think. Now, everything about this game is pure Bitmap Brothers. The visuals, the music, the gameplay, even down to the background noises between games with the ice cream seller shouting, ice cream, strangely enough. And of course, the get ready vocal at the beginning of each round. Now, now, also the theme music, here's interesting, the theme music was composed by John Fox, who was actually the original lead singer in British 80s electro-pop group Ultravox. Ultravox. You've got no idea what I'm on about, have you? In English, you basically just said that a chap that wrote the theme used to be the lead singer of some 80s band before Midjour came along. Basically. Don't so, underestimate me. So you know who Midjure is? Yeah. Some, I don't know. Wow. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Okay, I'll take it back. I'll take it back. Mm -hmm. I underestimated Come you. Me. Now, Speedball 2 has been released on over 19 platforms from the Acorn Archimedes to Symbian OS, if you can believe that, and of course went on to rave reviews. It still today is one of the most played retro games of all time, and to think it was released almost 30 years ago just sh shows how good Speedball 2 is. Yes, now, to cover every single game the Bitmap Brothers ever created would take us days. It would actually, yeah. But you do get an idea just how good this studio was, and the extent of the creative talent behind every game they've made. Yeah. There cannot be an ST or an Amiga owner on the planet that didn't have a Bitmap Brothers game in their collection. Yep, good it's point. It's not possible. Yeah. No, it's not. And <laughs> these games are still enjoyed so much now next up was a departure from their normal style of game and it was an isometric action adventure game called Cadaver that was released in 1990 and the inspiration for this came from the Bitmap Brothers love of Dungeon Master by FTL which is a stunning game. Cadaver itself is a stunningly gorgeous game to play no, but it was quite divisive amongst critics and Bitmap fans. It was a big departure from what they'd done before yeah. and it wasn't as successful as their That's previous games. Why I haven't really heard of it. No, it's still a great addition to their library 
Barbie and well worth playing today. Yeah, there was a follow-up to Cadaver released in 1991 called Cadaver, The Payoff. And this was followed by Gods in 1991. Oh, Gods. Gods was actually started by artist Mark Coleman after mm. Zenon 2 was finished and the game was in part inspired by a sort of ancient Greek warrior through a mythical dungeon and facing all manner of phantoms, ghosts and orcs and materialised uh, materialize out of thin air. My phone definitely didn't just go off halfway through that. Did your phone just bleep? Yeah, it went beep. I accidentally like, pr- anyway, <laughs> continue. That God. was very unprofessional. It was unprofessional actually. God is a brilliant horizontal platformer that looks and plays brilliantly. But interesting, the game features a basic AI routine. It's probably not basic. Basic, actually, sorry guys, it's an AI routine based on the player's health, what items they're carrying, and their score. So, depending on how well you're doing or not, they what's playing gods, reason. yeah, the game alters how and when enemies Ooh. are spawned, what fire rates there are, what oh, rewards you're intelligence. Yeah, and what rewards you're given to help you out. So, very, very clever stuff going on in the background while you're Next, playing gods. In 1991 came Magic Pockets, which I've never heard of, which is another platform type game featuring the big Mac kid, who was a kid with very large magic pockets. Yeah. Believe it or not. Incidentally, this game was actually hated by Eric Matthews. He didn't like it at all. No, ne- do you know what? No, I'm going to. Neither did I. I don't know what it is about the game. I just. I'm not keen on it. I don't like I've it. I've never played it, so I can't M- give a. No, opinion. magic pockets. I can't really say why. And I've got to have a sit and think about it, but the game actually caused some tension in the Bitmap Brothers studio as well. I think it was pretty divisive amongst the teams. A pre released beta version of this game was actually used on ITV's Saturday morning TV show called Motormouth, which was way, out before you were born. By the way, it's beta. Beta, beta? Beta. Okay. Get it right, Oliver. Interestingly, the title music for Magic Pockets was a version of Doing the Do by Betty Boo. Yes, it was. Great name. Mm. Magic Pockets, again, was scored highly by critics. Mike Montgomery said the game is like Marmite. (laughs) Some people like it, some people hate it. Some people say it's the best game ever did. It's not, but I'm glad we did it. And it did get us on the telly. It did get them on the telly, actually, yeah. I'm not a huge fan of Magic Pockets at all, and I just don't know why. Next up in 1993 was one of my favourite games on the Amiga. I have lots of favourite games on the Amiga, don't I? You have two... You, everything in here is practically your favourite game. <laughs> that's a good point. You know, that's why I pointed at... That. My favourite game. No, it's not yeah. Star Wars Starfighter. <laughs> <laughs> no, next up in 1993 was one of my favourite games on the Amiga and the CD32, and that was, of course, the awesome Chaos, Chaos Engine. Engine. Set in alternative steampunk Victorian age England, an inventor by the name of Baron Fortescue invents Brain. a powerful machine called the Chaos Engine, which, as you'd expect, becomes self aware kills the bloke and becomes incredibly powerful and starts to transform the English landscape, humans and animals into mutant grotesque beasts. Say beasts. No. I love Could the way happen. You, I love the way you say beasts. 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 <laughs> you play two out of six mercenaries whose job it is to kill everything that moves in a gauntlet style top down landscape full of puzzles and mazes. It really is a joy to play, especially in two player mode. The reason I'm smiling so much because it took us three cuts for him to say that. Now, I love the Chaos Engine, and there is a lot of AI routines running in the background, and again, totally transparent to the player. Especially if you play as a one player. If you play as one player, the computer plays the second character, and there's a lot, a lot of AI. Now, as in Magic Pockets, an early beta of the game, beta, was featured on TV again, and this time the British TV show Games Master. Yes. Now, the game was followed up by the Chaos Engine 2 in 1996. Let me guess, um, you made another Chaos Engine. They did make another Chaos Engine. No, no, because no, it's like, like the machine. Like, no, no, it, the events have moved on. They've defeated the Chaos Engine, they've defeated Fortescue, and there's something else going on there. Okay, and unlike the original game, this was a split-screen deathmatch-style game between the two players. Yeah, it was. Now, I've never actually played Chaos Engine 2. I hate to say that, but I haven't. So I can't comment, well, can but I, I've read and heard that it's another Marmite-style oh, game. God, some people one. love it. <laughs> some Others, people hate it. Some people hate it, yeah. I don't think it was as well received as the original Chaos Engine. Mm. And some of the developers themselves, I don't think, liked it. No. It was around this time that the home computer market was dwindling and the home consoles were becoming the new gaming platforms 
with the releases of Sega Saturn and PlayStation, although many Bitmap Brothers games were released on previous generation consoles, such as the Sega Genesis. Yeah, so you can get Speedball 2 on the Genesis. I guess it's not as good. Um, I don't think it's as good as the Amiga version. No, the colours are very, very different. Now, it's around about this point, I don't recall playing any more Bitmap Brothers games, and I went through a gaming hiatus in my life. There were just other things going on, yeah. and I didn't really play any video games, really, at this point, until I bought a PS1 in 1996. So, kind of like, I went from the Amiga, the death of the Amiga, the Amiga 1200, stopped playing for a few years, and then got into the PlayStation. The Bitmap Brothers, at this point, released a handful of games after Chaos Engine 2, such as Zed, Speedball 2100, but this was pretty much where my relationship with Bitmap Brothers games end. came to an end. So, what happened? Well, what happened now? That's almost pretty much it. The Bitmap Brothers brand ended in 2003 with a game called uh, World War II Frontline Command. I've never played it, I don't okay. know. Uh, Eric Matthews now works for Sony Worldwide Studios. Mike Montgomery is still in gaming. He works freelance, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and Steve Kelly works in web development. The rest of the team, and there were quite a few of them in the end, uh, are probably still involved in studio work. They're still involved... Probably developing something new. Yeah, they're still in involved in the gaming industry in some shape or form. Some have sadly passed away. The gaming industry has changed so much over the past 20 years, a developer like the Bitmap Brothers could not exist today no. as they were. There are too many suits, too many people interfering, and instead of 10 people writing a game, today yeah, you like have 5,000 5, people involved in writing a game. It's all about repetition and money today. Yes. So, <clears throat> the Bitmap Brothers belong to a time of what is known as Britsoft, yeah. when small groups of British coders were shaping gaming in the UK and creating some of the best love games of all time. Absolutely, yeah. Long yeah. before supersized publishers like EA and or Activision yeah. become hoovering up the talent <laughs> and churning out hundreds of FIFA clones and Call of Duty remakes, literally killing creativity. Yeah, and that's the point. Did I mean, you today, hear that FIFA 27 is coming out in five years' time? Yeah, so you've got hundreds of FIFA clones and it's just Call of Duty after Call of Duty. Not all of them. There are quite a few studios doing some really good modern stuff, actually. Yeah. But I'm, I'm so very glad these guys did what they did back in the day. They, these games are so very much treasured today, and they always will be. When I think of my Amiga and I feel like booting it up and having a game, usually a Bitmap Brothers game will be it's one of the awesome. first to choose. Yeah, yeah, whether that's Chaos Engine, Xenon, whatever. And it's it's a crime not to show kids today yeah. these games. It really is. I mean, Josh had never heard of the Bitmap Brothers until last year, and now he knows who they were, what games they produced. You know a lot about them. Yeah, but wouldn't it be great if they got back together and yeah. the game again? <laughs> yeah. Like they yeah. all got back to the come by themselves as an indie group and yeah. not under some huge publisher. Yeah, That'd yeah. be good. It would. If a few of them got back together and knocked something out, I think it would be absolutely brilliant. You know, Jeff Minter's still doing it. I like what they did and I like the way I like their artwork. Their I like artwork the artwork in is the games. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. They're kind of similar throughout the games and I like that. They it, have a style, you need, don't like, they? When you see the game, you can think, oh that's a bit my brother. So I think you've got a point there. I, I think you can instantly recognise a Bitmap Brother game, even if you didn't know it was a Bitmap Brother no, you game. Can say, that looks like Bitmap Brothers. Yeah, and you know, why the is that? Artwork. Just because of their style of artwork. Yeah, that's where they got their name from. Their, their style Bitmap. of artwork. Very, very talented artists. Definitely very talented mm. artists and coders. And their games are, are just stood the test of time. You can pick up. You can pick up certain retro games today. Play it for five minutes and go. Mm. This is really rubbish. This is nowhere near as good as I remember. You boot Xenon. You boot Gods or speedball and it's as good today as it was back as then. it was back then incidentally if you are interested in the bitmap brothers i can highly recommend a wonderful book uh, called the bitmap brothers universe check it out in there there is some great artwork there's some great stories points. and anecdotes and points it and helps it, to write this yeah show. and it really really does you know give you an insight into what life was like working for the bitmap brothers back in yes, the day so thank you very much for watching us please give us some comments and feedback uh, you can catch us on Facebook, you can catch us on Twitter, and if you want to support what we do and keep the lights on in the shed here, we are also on Patreon now. The link is below. Uh, we have been demonetized, so we're not making any money anymore. Let's not start on that. No, let's not go down that road again. If you want to support us, we have a Patreon link My chair is down spinning. below. Um, and we will catch you again soon when we'll be discussing. I don't know. Is it my choice next week? It's your choice next week, I think.
Yes. Uh, thank you very much for watching us. We do love your support, and thank you very much for subscribing. If you've not subscribed yet, please hit the subscribe button because it does and mean, like if you like what you see. It does mean an awful lot to us. So thank you very much. We'll take. Take care. Thank you very much. You guys take care. Not we'll take care. We do. We're we'll walking up the path. It's gonna be treacherous. Yeah, yeah. Take care now, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much. Bye Ooh. bye. Bye bye bye. Stampy Cat's curly hair got to do with anything? There's no, I don't want curly hair. You don't want curly hair? No, you want curly hair. Hey mate, if you lived in the 80s, you'd have a perm. Do you know perms were really big in the 80s? What's a perm? Perm, you don't want a perm, you make your hair curly. I don't know what perm is. I'll show you a picture of a perm, but back in the 80s, right, so many people about your age had perms. You could go into a hairdresser and have curlers is, put is in your like hair. Is that like 11 in Stranger Things has curly hair? That's a perm. He might have natural hair, but you know what? Eleven's a 